All right, well, over the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, covering this powerful um, passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And uh, if you have a Bible, if, uh, you can go ahead and turn to there. And we're going to go ahead and uh, let's just read it together. I, I think it would be kind of fun for us to uh, read the Word out loud together uh, as we get into this passage of Scripture. And uh, let's go ahead and put that up on the screen. And uh, we're going to go ahead and read this together. Isaiah chapter 9, 6. Let's go ahead and start. For, for unto us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Awesome. This is a familiar Bible verse. Um, if, uh, if you, maybe if you've ever given out a religious uh, Christmas card, Isaiah 9-6 might, might have been on it. It's, it's such, such a powerful verse. It's actually a prophecy uh, that was written uh, a couple centuries before Jesus was even born. And Isaiah, he prophesies about this Messiah. And in the prophecy, he says the, 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 pro, the Messiah will actually fulfill four names. And these four names over these next few weeks, uh, we're going to be going over them. And they're very simple, wonderful counselor, uh, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. And so today, as uh, we start this off today, I'm going to be covering the very first one, which is wonderful counselor, wonderful counselor. And as I was thinking about this, you know, when I became a pastor, uh, I didn't realize the many hats that I would have to wear. You know, uh, I remember feeling like it was something that I wanted to do. I felt called into the ministry. I was about 16 years old. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I thought, well, probably the majority of what a pastor does is he just preaches on Sunday. I love it when people come to me, by the way. People have done this. I've been in ministry now over 20 years. People often come to me and say, what do you do the rest? What do you do all week? You know, it's like, you know, I mean, you just, don't you work just one day a week? I, I, I love that question. But anyway, it's like, yeah, I just twiddle my thumbs all week and then just wait for Sunday. No, but, um, but a lot of times uh, as a pastor, I didn't realize like the many hats uh, that I would have to wear. So when I, you know, when I went to Bible college, uh, a majority of my, uh, of the classes that I took was of course Bible. They were all Bible. I mean, uh, you know, uh, different books of the Bible. I had to take classes on different books of the Bible, theology classes like uh, eschatology, the study of the end times, pneumonology, the study of the Holy Spirit, systematic theology, systematic study of the whole Bible. And so uh, these were a, a big portion of the classes that I had to take. And so going into ministry, that's what I thought. You know, that a, a good portion of what I would do is simply preach messages. And, and, and it is. It's, it's obviously a big part of that. But uh, when you get into ministry, you realize there's a lot more hats that you have to wear. You know, for example, I have to be an administrator. You know, I have to oversee uh, uh, calendars and, and budgets and finances. That's, that's one hat that I have to wear. Uh, another hat is uh, as the church began to grow, especially in Montezuma, we had uh, seven staff members. So I had to become a boss. I had to become a supervisor. I had to oversee different people on our team. We had secretaries and different other, uh, we had a janitor, we had other pastors. And so part of it was staff meetings and actually running meetings. I had to learn how to do that. Uh, part of pastoring is uh, shepherding. Uh, Pre-COVID, one of the things that I, I really enjoy uh, which uh, with COVID now, it, it, they don't allow us to, but pastors, I would often go in before somebody would have a surgery and I would be able to go into the hospital and pray for people, visit people in the hospital. Uh, I'm hoping that the hospitals will eventually let me back in, but right now they're not. But that, that was another hat that I would wear. Uh, officiant. So, you know, I do weddings, I do funerals. And so that's another part of a role. But uh, another role that they didn't tell me about was the role of a counselor. It was the role of a counselor. Now, out of all of the Bible classes that I took, I, only, I was only required to take one class on counseling, biblical counseling. And so, but yet, a, a good majority of what I do sometimes is meeting with people, talking with people, and, and praying with people, and sometimes people ask for advice in different areas of their life. So whether that's grief or, or marriage or just somebody to talk to, uh, oftentimes I'll meet with people and just talk. And so I have, sometimes I have to wear this hat of a counselor. And maybe you have actually fulfilled the role of a counselor. Maybe you don't even know it. But maybe you've also 
been a counselor, maybe not in a role as a pastor, but I'm sure all of you here, one degree or another, you've counseled somebody. If you're a parent, you've counseled your kids. Now, it doesn't mean they've listened to you, right? But you've counseled them on certain things. I know in the wintertime, I'm constantly giving my kids wisdom to wear pants and wear a winter coat. That's wisdom. It's negative 30 degrees outside, right? But yet they come down from their room wearing shorts and they think they can leave the house without a coat, you know? But again, it's, you know, they don't listen sometimes. But if you've been a parent, right, you've offered wisdom. You've probably offered counsel, right? Uh, if, you know, maybe you've uh, offered counseling to a friend. A friend has come, come to you, and, and you're close to them, and so uh, they've asked for your advice on something. Maybe you've counseled a friend. Uh, these are just some areas. And then on the other side, maybe you've been on the receiving end of counseling. Uh, maybe, again, maybe you've gone to your parent. It, it's kind of funny. Kids, they, they don't like to listen to their parents when they're teenagers, but then when we become adults, then all of a sudden we listen to our parents, right? We all of a sudden now go to our parents and ask for, we ask for advice when we're in our 30s. But, but yeah, so you know, maybe you've been on that receiving end, that you've went to somebody and said, hey, what do you think about this? I need some wisdom in this area of my life. And maybe you've received some wisdom. Maybe you've received some counseling. Maybe you've even received professional counseling. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I've, I've been in sessions before. I've sat in an office before with a professional counselor. Maybe there's areas in your life that you had to go to somebody professionally and, and seek some wisdom in some area of your life. There's nothing wrong with that. But today, as we kick off this Christmas series and we look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we're going to look at the first name of uh, the prophecy that Isaiah gave about the coming Messiah and that he would be a wonderful counselor. Because here's something that I know, that I'm sure you know as well, that there are often times where maybe you've been on the receiving end of counseling, or maybe somebody's, you've went to somebody, you've asked for advice, you've asked for wisdom, and maybe it just wasn't everything that you needed. Or maybe on the other end, maybe you've been the one who somebody's come to you and they've asked for wisdom, they've asked for advice, and maybe you've been in this situation where you're like, man, you're praying under your breath and you're saying, God, I don't know what to say to this person. They're, they're in a real predicament. They really need some wisdom and I'm not for sure what to say or how to help them. I'm sure some of us have come to those, those situations, even as a pastor, again, uh, my knowledge is sometimes limited. My wisdom is sometimes limited when it comes to certain areas in people's lives and struggles that they're going through. And sometimes I just don't know what to say except for just to pray for them because I know that even though I may not have the words to say, and even though I am not a perfect counselor, I do know that there is a wonderful counselor. That there is someone who's beyond human understanding. There's someone who goes beyond our limited knowledge, and that is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's what Isaiah is prophesying in this passage. Now, as we dig into this this morning and understand the context of Isaiah chapter 9, I always think it's important that we understand this, this Isaiah is a big book, if you've ever looked into it. It's a big book. It actually covers two centuries. It covers three time periods in Israel. It covers before an exile of Babylon, uh, during, the ex, uh, during the captivity, and then afterwards. So there's actually three time periods in, in Isaiah. It's a huge book. And so Isaiah chapter 9 is before the exile. And it's kind of interesting because during this time period, the king, uh, actually the king of Judah, during this time period, Israel actually split into two kingdoms, the north and the south. Judah is where Jerusalem was located. It's the capital. That's where Ahaz was located. And Ahaz needed wisdom. He needed wisdom. And so the prophet Isaiah comes to him and he offers him some wisdom about whether or not to join a treaty with a neighboring nation, Assyria. Uh, they were kind of the superpower during this time. And so Isaiah counsels Ahaz and tells Ahaz not to do it. Because the cost would be too high. But Ahaz, in fear, 
went ahead and made this partnership with Assyria. And because of that, uh, Judah became a vassal of Assyria. They had to pay tribute to them. Uh, and the, kind of the agreement was Assyria would protect, uh, protect Judah in return. But again, Isaiah prophesied, says, don't do it because the cost is going to be too high. And it was because Assyria actually brought in idol worship into the temple and, and it actually caused a lot of problems. So I kind of give you that background because it is interesting that here that in this context, Ahaz during this time would not listen to the counsel of Isaiah. And so Isaiah prophesies that there is going to come a day where there is going to be a new king, another king in which the government will be upon his shoulders right? That's what he's talking about, this promised Messiah. The government will be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called the Wonderful Counselor. Instead of receiving wisdom, the Messiah is going to be giving the wisdom. He's going to be one that's going to be full of wisdom. And so let's just take a look at these two words, if you're following along in your notes this morning. Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor. The first word is wonderful, uh, the Hebrew word here is Pele, which really means this, too wonderful for words, too wonderful for words. Um, in our household, we have two Christmas traditions. Well, we have a lot of Christmas traditions, but one of the things is during Thanksgiving weekend, uh, we always go get our Christmas tree, and then we bring back the Christmas tree, and after we decorate the Christmas tree, we watch the movie Elf right? I mean, it's like one of the greatest Christmas movies ever, right? So, so we always watch Elf. That's kind of, we kick off the Christmas season with Elf. And then to end the Christmas season, uh, we send the kids to bed. And when Jennifer and I are getting the presents re ready, we usually turn on the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, right? And that's another good one. And so it's a wonderful life. George Bailey, you know, he, he's chasing after his dream and uh, ends up taking over the bank for his dad. And of course, then, you know, he has, comes into money problems. And, and so the angel uh, comes along and, you know, he's going to commit suicide. And the angel shows him uh, actually how wonderful his life really is. You know, he thinks his life is so horrible. And the angel tells him this, everybody, how, how many people depend upon you? Your life, it truly is wonderful. So I love that word wonderful. In the Hebrew, it means too wonderful for words, but it actually means something more than that. If you look at it in the Hebrew and you study other passages, uh, it's interesting. One passage is Exodus chapter 15. After Israel crossed the Red Sea, and after they cross the Red Sea, Moses kind of, he, he has this song of praise, and he's praising God. And in this praise, he talks about the wonders of God, the wonder of God, the Pele of God. And so this also can mean not only mean too marvelous for words, but it can also mean the miraculous. When you think about signs and wonders, okay? So this word, wonderful, actually can mean miraculous, miraculous. Pele. And then you take the next word, which is yachts, which is counselor, and that just simply means to advise or to give wisdom. Okay? It means to, to advise, to guide, or to counsel, or also to give wisdom. So let's put these words together as Isaiah is prophesying about the coming Messiah. This is so good. He's saying the Messiah is going to give not just any wisdom, not just human wisdom that's often limited. He is going to give us miraculous wisdom, miraculous counsel, miraculous advice. And this is the type of counselor that we can go to. Because even if you go to a professional counselor, again, I think professional counseling is, is good, but again, they, have a, they, they specialize in certain areas, don't they? If you go to a financial counselor, they're going to advise you in your finances. If you go to a marriage counselor, they're going to advise you in marriage. Uh, some counselors, they specialize in grief, uh, trauma, mental health, all these sorts of things. Very, very good stuff, right? It's, it's important. But here, this prophecy is that the wonderful counselor is he is not limited or just specializes in a certain area because his wisdom is beyond our understanding. You see, Jesus fulfills this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, 6, as he is the wonderful counselor. Amen? So I want to show you this. Let's go ahead and go to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture that Paul talks about how Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. This is, this is really powerful because uh, Corinthians was written by Paul, and he's writing to the church in Corinth. And the church in Corinth was known for their philosophy. They were known for their wisdom. They, they, in fact, they worshipped it. In fact, it was that, that's, they worshipped knowledge. Uh, and, and so Paul, he's writing to, again, a, a group of, of people that are searching for wisdom. They're seeking wisdom. And in this passage, Paul reveals that Christ is the wisdom of God. Look at verse 20. That's also on the screen there. But here's, we're going to kind of jump around. But it says this, where is the wise... Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this, of, this, of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, because it pleased God through the foolishness of the message that has been preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks, they seek after wisdom." But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the what? The wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Man, this is so good. Paul says, where is the wise man? Where's the philosopher of this age? And he goes on to say, God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. So where really what man says is wisdom, God says, I have, I have made man's wisdom look like foolishness. And so how did he do that? He did it through the cross. You see, in the cross, again, if you look at the cross, it, 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 even people today, they, they struggle with this idea of the cross, that God would send his one and only son to the world to die on a cross so that all of us could be saved and all of us could have eternal life. When people sometimes hear that story, they say that just sounds foolish. You know, even in... Paul's day, people were saying the same thing, and he, he kind of breaks it down. He says, to the Jew, it was foolishness. Why? Because those who died upon a tree, it was considered a curse. In the Old Testament law, if you died by, by, by being hung, it was considered a curse. You were cursed by God. So the Jews said, Jesus can't be the Savior because he died on a tree. That's foolish, and the Greeks, they looked at it and said, that makes no sense. Kind of like today, people would say, that makes no sense at all. The cross was a means of execution. It was a means of torture. God wouldn't do something like that. Why, why would God orchestrate all of that? And so to the Greeks, it was foolish. But Paul goes on to say, but yet to God, the cross is the power of God. That Jesus, who lived a sinless life, came to this earth and he died on the cross for our sins so that we could be saved. That is the power of God. And I love what he says here. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Now, Paul's not saying here that God is foolish. Paul's not saying that God is weak. But he's making this comparison. If you compare human wisdom to God's wisdom, there is no comparison. There's no comparison. And so he goes on in verse 26. Let's keep reading. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, not that you may be wise according to the flesh, not as mighty, not many as noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen those things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Not that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us, again, here it is, Jesus Christ who became for us, what? The wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So God chose 
right? The weak things of this world to shame the wise. Think of the Christmas story. God could have chose a hundred ways to bring Jesus into this world. But yet, you think about it. What, what did God do? What was his plan? Jesus was supposed to be a king. Remember, the government shall be upon his shoulders. So people would say, well, he's supposed to be born into royalty. He's supposed to be born in a palace. He's supposed to be born of a king or a queen. But yet, Jesus was born by a couple peasants, Mary and Joseph. They were nobodies. And instead of being born in a palace, Jesus was born in a, in a barn, a bunch of stinky animals, right? He was placed in a feeding trough of all places. And the world says that's foolishness. But to God, it was wise. The manger is foolishness. The cross, foolishness. Even the church, foolishness. That God would use a bunch of ragtag men, fishermen, tax collectors. But yet God chose them to start the church. Are you following me this morning? Do you see what the world looks at? The world looks at the manger. The world looks at the cross. The world looks at the church and says, foolish, foolish, foolish. But God says, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. It's wise. Because God's wisdom is greater than man's. Christ is the wisdom of God. And so he is the fulfillment of this passage in Isaiah 9, 6. Now, for the remainder of my time, I want to get real practical, okay? I wanted to give you a little theology, a little, a little uh, get deep into the word, and now we're going to get practical, okay? So the next question I want to lead into is this. So then how do we receive this wisdom? If Jesus is the wisdom of God, how do I receive wisdom? Because maybe some of you this morning, you need wisdom, Maybe you need wisdom in your family. Maybe you need wisdom uh, with your kids. Maybe you need uh, wisdom in your job. And you say, Pastor Todd, I need miraculous, I need supernatural wisdom. So how do we receive this type of wisdom? Well, uh, what I want to do is I want us to kind of uh, imagine this morning that if you're making an appointment with a counselor, okay? And if you're making an appointment with a counselor, you come in to the building, whatever it is. There might be a lobby, might be a receptionist there. And you say, I'm here to see the wonderful counselor. And the receptionist buzzes and says, so-and-so is here to see you, right? Wonderful counselor comes out into the lobby, greets you, invites you into his office. You come in, you, you come into the office. There's a nice couch right there and he invites you to sit on the couch. You sit on the couch and now the wonderful counselor, he sits down across from you. He's got a nice chair. He sits down and now you're looking at each other eye to eye. So what's the next steps? What's the next steps? Well, if you're talking to a counselor, the first thing is, well, that's it right there. Number one, the first thing is you talk to the counselor because the counselor is going to say, what's on your mind? <laughs> talk to me. What's going on in your life? All right? So What's the first step? The first step is talk to the counselor. Talk to the wonderful counselor. Do you know that God is relational? He is a relational God. He wants a relationship. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge, here's that word, knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So we talk about the fear of God. The fear of God is not, I'm scared of God. If I do something wrong, he's going to strike me down. The fear of God is a healthy respect of who God is. It's like a healthy respect of your parents. A few weeks ago, I shared the story about my dad, you know, and about when I, 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 I went, to the, uh, went to my friend's grandma's house, right, for cookies, right? And so I, I had a healthy fear of my dad from that point on, right? And some of you understand that, right? You had a healthy fear, healthy respect, right? And so that's what it is with God. It's a healthy respect of God. Now, but it also goes on to say knowledge of the Holy One. So if you have to know somebody, you're in relationship with them. So talk to the counselor. Listen to James, who's the half-brother of Jesus. He wrote this in James 1.5. I quote this verse all the time because it says, if any of you lacks wisdom... You should what? You should what? Ask. Yeah. You should ask God 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Does it sound like God wants to hold back wisdom? No. He wants to give wisdom, and he wants to give it generously. You, you ever know somebody that they, uh, maybe they know some information that you don't know, and they're holding it back because it makes them feel a little bit more powerful? <laughs> You know, it's like, I know something you don't know, you know. Uh, and, and so they're like, they're holding that back. They're kind of holding back something and, and, and they're doing it on purpose, you know, because it just makes them feel good about themselves. And, and, but not God. The Bible says God doesn't hold back his wisdom. He gives it out generously. So if you need wisdom, talk to the counselor. All right, so you're sitting down. That's the first thing you do. You talk. And then the second thing you do is this. After you talk, you listen to what the counselor has to say, right? Because after you've talked, the counselor then is going to talk back. And he may ask some questions, but, but again, there's some dialogue there. But, but he's kind of calm, and he's going to give you some wisdom, some advice that maybe that you need. Now, this is where a lot of people get tripped up. It's okay, well, how do I hear from God? How do I... How do I receive this type of wisdom? Well, in your notes, I've got three areas real quickly. The, for the first thing is uh, we receive, God speaks to us through his word, number one, his word. You know, I, I'm just so many, I'm, so many times I'm surprised that, you know, God's word is so clear on so many things, and yet a lot of times we don't know what the book says. Uh, here's a challenge. If you need wisdom, uh, read the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. You know, Solomon was in a predicament where he needed wisdom from God. He was going to be this, the, the king over Israel after his father David had died. And so he needed wisdom on how to rule this nation. And so what does he do? He prays to God, God, give me wisdom to rule this nation. And God gave it to him. And so he wrote the book of Proverbs, and there are 31 Proverbs. You can just read one proverb a day, and in the Proverbs, there is so much wisdom for us to gain if you just read the Word of God. God speaks to us through His Word. A second way is through His Spirit. His Spirit. His Holy Spirit. We sang that song this morning, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place. Fill the atmosphere. Right? The Holy Spirit, Jesus said to his disciples that I have to go away because I'm going to send another one like me, and he is going to be a counselor, and he's going to guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit can be a counselor. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. If you are born again, if you've received Christ into your life, his Spirit lives within you, and his Spirit can guide you, and can lead you into wisdom. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. I'm not going to read all of this because of time. But again, Paul, his theme here is wisdom, and he reveals that Christ is the wisdom of God, but then he moves on to talk about how Christ has sent us his spirit to live within us so that we can know the mind of God. This is powerful. It says this, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not a spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Man. That's powerful. So Paul is saying that, that God has given you his spirit. And how do you know the thoughts of God? How do you know the mind of God? You know the thoughts and the mind of God through his spirit. Through his spirit that lives within you. And I realize that takes time to, to walk according to the spirit and, and, to, and to listen to the spirit. But I want to encourage you to, to learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life because the Holy Spirit can guide you and lead you into all truth. And here's the last one. His word, his spirit, his people. His word, his spirit, his people. Now, not just any people. Go to people who have the spirit of God in them. 
right? So don't, don't go to your, don't go to your, you know, the buddies that are, uh, you know, that, that you know they're going to give you bad advice and you know that they're going to lead you the wrong way. No, that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about go to people that have the spirit of God within him. I would, I would go to people who have walked the walk of faith. Go to some people with gray hair. Amen? The Bible says gray hair is a sign of wisdom. They've lived it, right? So go to some people with some gray hair. I'm, I'm getting gray in my beard, I'm, but uh, that's, that's a whole other story. But anyway, just for men, I need to get some of that. But anyway, but, but actually the Bible says it's wisdom, right? So the, the saints of God who have lived this life, who spent hours and hours in prayer, again, find some godly wisdom. Proverbs chapter 12, 15, the way of a fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 24, 6 says, surely you need guidance to wage war and victory is won through many advisors. We're waging a war. Now, in this passage, it's talking about physical war, but Paul says we're waging a spiritual war, right? Not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And if we're going to wage a spiritual war, we need to have people around us. They're going to help us and build us up. So his word, his spirit, his people. So those, these are ways that we can listen to the counselor. These are ways that we can listen to the counselor, okay? So we went into the office, we've sat down, we've talked, we've listened. Now here's the last step. This is the final one this morning. The final one is we need to obey. Because after the counseling session is done, you walk out of the office, you get in your car, you, you turn the key and you drive off and now you have a choice to make. What am I going to do? Am I going to practice, gonna put this into practice? Am I going to do what the counselor has said or am I just going to continue to live the life that I've always lived and continue to go on the way that I've always done it? You see, the last part is obedience. It's actually doing what the counselor has told you to do. You know, I, I, we have a lot of people today that they know a lot of things, but they don't practice it. It's like in sports, and I'm guilty of this. Probably last night, the Iowa Hawkeye game, Michigan, right? Let's just get real, okay? We probably were all watching that game, you know, saying, why, why did Ferentz make that call? Why did that quarterback do that? You know, again, we're probably second-guessing everything that the coach was calling or the plays that were going on, and we're thinking to ourselves, we can do a better job, right? I do that all the time with my Browns, right? I actually think that I can do a bit. No, I'm just joking. But, but again, isn't that funny how we do that? We do that all the time. You know, it's like, you know, and again, we, we think we know everything, but yet if we were actually on the field making the calls, right, we don't practice it. We don't practice. And sometimes I wonder when it comes to our faith, you know, sometimes we know what the Bible says, Sometimes we can sense his spirit telling us what to do. And even times we may have had people speak into our lives, kind of like uh, Isaiah was to Ahaz as he was counseling him, but yet we refuse to listen. You see, sometimes we have it up here, but we don't apply it. And here's the last verse that I want to give. Jesus talked about this in a parable. You probably know it. It's the parable of the wise and foolish builder, <laughs> right? Where Jesus said the wise man built his house on the what? The wise man built his house upon the? The wise man built his house upon the? Rock. I don't even know if I'm singing that right, but anyways. The wise man built his house upon the rock. When the storms came, the wind blew, right? The house was able to stand because it had a strong foundation. And Jesus said the foolish man built his house upon what? There's not a song about that guy. Because the wind came and the waves came crashing down. And what? The house was destroyed. But listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and what? Puts them into practice. That's the key part of this verse. 
puts them into practice. If you put his word into practice, you are like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Right? Put it into practice. You see, this is, this is where the action meets. I mean, this is, this is where we got to put it into action. And so this morning, as the worship team is going to come back up this morning, we're going we're to wrap this up. I just want to close with this question this morning. Do you need wisdom? Do you need wisdom? I need wisdom. There's a lot of areas I need wisdom in. I need wisdom as we're past, uh, pastoring this church. You know, we're, we're at a pivotal point in our church, and we've, we're looking at some property. We're looking at land. And, and you know, I'm praying, God, give us wisdom. Where, you know, where do you want this church to be? Because we, you know, we, we find some land. I mean, the, the church is going to be there permanently forever. So we need wisdom. We need wisdom. I need wisdom. I need wisdom on how to raise our kids. I need wisdom uh, in everyday situations sometimes. And I'm sure this morning every person in here would say, you know what, Pastor Todd, I need wisdom too. Maybe it's a, a job. Maybe you're uh, in high school and you're thinking about college and you need wisdom on what college that you're going to attend. Maybe you're a parent this morning and you need wisdom with a certain child. It, it, it may be even an adult child that's already grown and out of the house, but you still need wisdom on what to say. I don't know this morning where you're at this morning, but I, I just believe today that this is so practical for all of us that all of us in this room could probably say we need wisdom in some areas. But here's the good news. The good news is, just as James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, go to God. Because he's not holding it back. Our God gives wisdom and he gives it liberally and he gives it without reproach. And so today, if you need wisdom, I want to encourage you to go to the wonderful counselor. Make an appointment with the wonderful counselor. And just soak in what he has to say to you this morning. Let's bow our heads this morning.